Hi and welcome to the World Beyond Belief. My name is Paul Marco and today we're going to talk about Common Core. Now, according to Charlotte Ezerbeit, who is an expert on the subject, Common Core is a major strategy in the dumbing down of America. And I found out that in addition to dumbing down and confusing our youth, it's also hypersexualizing them and teaching them a type of thought process called moral relativity, situational ethics. Well, there's no right, there's no wrong, there's just, just, there just is. Uh, today we're going to take a look at that and see how they're using this poor, the poor people are stric stricken by gender identity disorder again in this plot. All right, so let's take a moment and learn what's going on with Common Core. Well, first let's ground our conversation in some reality. According to science, there are two sexes. In humans, this would be man and a woman, or boy and girl. In animals, male or female. And now there's what is called gender. This is a similar category of humans, but it's outside of the male and female binary classification and is based on an individual's personal awareness or identity. So it's not a physical biology. This is a preference. Now, sexual ambiguity about gender identity, or what they call gender identity disorder, is a horrible mental disorder that can affect three in a thousand persons, which is 0.3%. This affliction rate is fewer than ADHD, which affects about 11% of children or ODD, and if you haven't heard of that, it's Oppositional Defiance Disorder, which affects about 40% of boys and 25% of girls. And then there's autism, which is about 15%, according to the CDC. It's much higher in boys, regardless of their gender. Now, to put this in proper perspective, let's say that an average elementary school has 400 students. This means that 44 children will have ADHD, and they're usually medicated. 160 boys and 100 girls will suffer from ODD, and this now is generally medicated also. 60 are likely to be autistic, sometimes they're not in the school, and it's usually medicated. One could suffer from gender identity disorder, and it's not medicated although this disorder has been shown to be effectively treated with a drug called pemazide. So in a logical and rational society, these individuals with gender identity disorder would receive specific attention and treatment to either relieve their suffering or find specific accommodations within the school or, or maybe without, outside the school in the community. Now in a rational society, their main concern would be what happens to the 399 children as they're made to wrap their heads around a vague condition the one student in their school may have. These are dangerous concepts to a society, for any society to embrace, and they're dangerous especially for children. Dangerous all through elementary school, but especially damaging to kindergarten, first and second grade level. Now. Children function mentally very different than adults. Developmental stages are my field. I've done some research on it. I've written a book on it. So I, I kind of know what I'm talking about here. Researchers from Piaget to Lovinger explain that around six or seven years of age, most children move from a very self-centered stage, which is it's so self-centered, it's often called the self-protective stage, to what most researchers refer to as the conformist stage. They love this title because it really describes how they think at this stage. It's a critical stage for development of all children because this is when they learn to become part of society. During this stage, they see wisdom and authority and identity with a group. You know, before they were on their own. Now they can see that they can become part of a group. It could be like the first graders, their family at home, the elementary school, or it's usually the sexual identity. Boys do this and girls do that. They're very black and white thinkers this time. They love anything that can be dogmatized. This means structure and conformity and repeatability. They believe in right and wrong and usually there's only one right. See, they're very black and white. They have no tolerance for ambiguity. 
actually this tolerance doesn't come for a long time. It comes kicks in for a lot of people about the age 14, but many people never do develop enough tolerance for ambiguity that they can embrace a washy concept like a gender confusion and gender identity. Truth at this, at this age needs confirmation from the environment. That means the teachers and the parents have to confirm what they're thinking before they can really adopt it. This makes them really manipulatable. They see themselves as an abstraction that can be manipulated. So during this stage, you can see how training them in this ambiguous idea of, of gender can really be damaging. Also at this time, authority has power to influence everything. In other words, they really, they, they see the wisdom in authority, they look up to authority, and they, they listen to authority. Generally, you know, there's a whole, I, I just told you how many people have ODD, and they would, certainly, they would be opposed to authority, but most people. They can't deal with complexity at all. Even their emotions are simple. Something like melancholy is way out of their ballpark. They know happy, sad, mad. The more sophisticated emotions come later. It's also the stage of shoulds. So women should act a certain way. Men should act a certain way. Police officers should act a certain way. Teachers should behave a certain way. Very much about shoulds. They like, like predictability and they love stability. So to allow for proper development during the stage, any sane society would capitalize on these tendencies. They teach math rules, grammar rules, sexual roles needed for the continuance of society, order, consistency, and develop understanding, starting with concretes. Consistency between parent and teacher is paramount. Proper understanding of gender is something that can only be really understood in a stage that normally kicks in much later where deviations and exceptions meld with a tolerance for ambiguity. You don't start teaching math with calculus. You start with simple adding and subtraction. So in my informed opinion, starting with complicated concepts surrounding sex and gender, at this age, at the conformist stage, will have lasting damage on the 399 students in this elementary school. Lasting damage that cannot be reversed. Let's take a minute and listen to an interview with an expert called Dr. Duke Pesta. Now, he's an expert on Common Core. And he's going to teach us what is happening in Common Core in the 47 states that have allowed this deviance into their children's minds. Kindergarten, Duke. You, I, have, I mean, I'm looking at these standards for kindergarten. And what it is, it's about defining sex as as a construct, defining gender for kindergarten first and second graders as a construct. Yep, and the thing to step back for just a quick second, these national sexuality standards, which have been written, you can get them online, they break up sexuality education into groups of triads, three-year periods, kindergarten, first, second grade. Those three grades have to meet a standard, fourth, fifth, sixth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you're right, they start with kids as young as five years old, and they are asking kids to learn things that are utterly develop me, developmentally inappropriate for kids that age. So for instance, in kindergarten, for, for the fifth, sixth, and seventh graders, they have to define, uh, they have to, to f show ways to demonstrate respect for different kinds of families. So in other words, um, you've got a five, six, or seven-year-old who has to uh, argue for ways that all families are equal. They come from a home that teaches biblical Christianity or morality. They come from an environment where... And they're cognitively five, six, and seven years old. How do they process this? How do you process this at that age? So uh, what they're doing is the federal government has now decided that it and it alone has the definitive authority on, is the definitive authority on what sex is. And so we're setting and up... And what gender a, is. And what gender and what, is. And what family uh -huh. is and what everything else is. We're setting up a huge conflict between what your parents teach and what gets taught. So I'm looking at uh, standards for K2, 5 six, seven-year-olds, kindergarten, first, and second graders, under identity, sexual identity. Now imagine a f your five-year-old, your kindergartner, all right, will be asked to provide examples of how friends, family, media, society, and culture influence ways boys and girls think they should act. That is a question that seems to me 
uh, to be a question that's almost a college level question. I mean, that's looking at how, you know, different things affect perceptions of gender. Um, this is telling kids, number one, that gender is, is something that is about perception and only perception. And secondly, telling them to look up examples and come up with examples on a concept that right now at, a, at five, six, and seven, they think I'm a boy, you're a girl. That's it. Not only are these explicit standards, they are also standards that are meant to be infused in all of the other subject matters. So this is, this is we'll talk about hiring sexuality teachers and things like that, but Duke, you were telling me this morning, this is supposed to be an English literature, it's supposed to be or English language arts, science, social science, mathematics, that these sexuality standards are supposed to be infused throughout the entire curriculum. Well, think about it. They don't have health class for five-year-olds. They're not going to create a health class for five-year-olds. The only way these standards can be met if, is if they become a part of every single existing curriculum. If you get this document online and look at page six, it explicitly tells you on page six of the document that these sexuality standards have been cross-referenced with English and language, language arts and math standards already in place in Common Core. So you're not going to in any way, shape, or form have kids pulled out of class and dumped in, in health class. These are going to be in every in math and history and science, every class. And what you point out is exactly right, which what's so insidious about these, at least math and English are actual standards you can look at and fight back against. These standards were never meant to be rolled out as, okay, look, everybody. We're going to take our sexual identity test today. Exactly. <laughs> this will never be on anybody's formal radar because it's written, it's there, and all they're going to do is fold it into existing curriculum so you don't have an actual target to fight against. You're going to have to fight against the math and English standards because they're going to become so intertwined with the sexuality. It's one of the reasons why, for anybody who's been paying attention to Common Core, we've been talking for, for weeks and months now about why are so many of these Common Core exemplar texts so highly sexualized? Why are they reading things like the bluest eye in ninth grade? Well, now you know, because they're already beginning to conform to this curriculum that no, that's on nobody's radar. Keep in mind that these are performance-based criteria. That means that students at various ages must demonstrate competency. Demonstrate competency. Gender roles is the social mm -hmm. expectations of how people should act, think, and or feel based on their assigned biological sex. Now, teaching transgender buzzwords and mentally processing the responses that make girls girls, make, that make girls girls and boys boys, is not really appropriate material to be taught to five to seven year olds. Now, what we are being told again is that this would never happen in Ohio. We would never allow this. But at the 2014 OSB, which is the Ohio School Board Association's Capital Conference and Trade Show, just a few months ago, everyone was informed that Ohio, are ne that Ohio is now subjected to the progressive federal discrimination laws that call for free reign access to gender specific facilities and gender separated activities. So what this means is that if Johnny wakes up feeling like Jasmine that day, he is permitted to use the restrooms or the locker rooms of the gender in which he identifies with, including overnight trips. <clears throat> Otherwise, the district will be at risk for litigation on grounds of harassment. Now, adding to this madness is the fact that this recommendation also applies to staff member Mr. Smith, who may wake up feeling like Mrs. Smith. <clears throat> now, back to the standards. What about in grades three through five? By the end of fifth grade, students should be able to define sexual orientation as the romantic attraction of an individual to someone of the same gender or a different gender. Now, notice how the same gender is listed first. Also, identify parents or other trusted adults of whom students can ask questions about sexual orientation. And when learning about birth control in eighth grade, abstinence is mentioned as an option in the early stages, early stages of a relationship only. Um, under their standards, um, under the guiding principles and values, I just wanted to show you, hopefully you can see those good. Um, number five, that students need opportunities to engage in activities um, relating to sexual or um, education. And number eight, students need multiple opportunities and a variety of assessment strategies to determine their achievement and their performance. Okay, so as you can see, this is already starting in Ohio, but what about other states across the country? Well, this is a poster that was hanging in front of a classroom in Shawnee, Kansas, which is a very conservative area right in the Bible Belt. 
A 13-year-old girl took a, this, a picture of this with her cell phone and showed her dad. He, of course, phoned the school and found out that it was indeed a part of their sex curriculum. Now, Leanne Neal, a spokesperson for the Shawnee Mission School, stated that the curriculum it is a part of, it aligns with national standards around those topics, and it's part of our curriculum in the school district. She added that the approved curriculum is in keeping with what other schools around the country are doing as well. It's already here. This is the destruction of modesty and the removal of our Judeo-Christian um, morals. There was a uh, case of a, of a poster being put up, and I believe it was a fifth or a sixth grade middle school class in Kansas uh, that had very, very uh, distressing things on it. We'll get to that in a sec. The, um, the, the principal said that the curriculum is part of, it aligns with national standards around those topics and is part of our curriculum in the school district. And this was, you know, to, uh, how do people express sexual feelings? Fifth, sixth graders, oral sex, sexual fantasy, anal sex, masturbation, you know, cuddling on the couch. Fifth, sixth grade. And the principal admitted this was part of Common Core. So, yeah, think about it. There's a big poster in this middle school classroom. It's right up there alongside Clifford the Big Red Dog and the ABCs. Middle school kids are sitting in class, and they're learning, and this poster is staring him in the face. And the title of the poster is, How Do People Express Their Sexual Feelings? You've got kissing and caressing with all that vulgar list of things. And so when a, a middle school kid took so a... So kissing be kid, is exactly the same... Dancing. Is ...in dancing, and holding hands is on this mm -hmm. list, too as as you know grinding is on the list as anal sex i mean you know i don't mean to be gross but they've now taken affection and and an affectionate behavior and equated it with deviance in some cases you see the moral relativity here right that there's not a single thing that distinguishes any of these behaviors no so you can see what's happened you can see from this poster that with moral relativity there are no standards except for those that are made politically correct by whatever pressure group is pushing the political correct button. And this culture that's running this the show now is definitely dark and not in any way related to the Judeo-Christian society that got us so far. Knowing this Luciferian culture that's being created here, you can see the advent of all kinds of deviations, including the one that's right on our doorstep, pedophilia. Here's a book that predated Common Core, but it's been approved by Common Core and has its stamp on the back. It's found in adult bookstores, video rentals, and sealed in black plastic bags. But the last place parents would expect to find pornography is in the hands of their 10-year-old child. Endorsed by Planned Parenthood, the book It's Perfectly Normal has a label on its front cover stating that it is for ages 10 and up. However, a Washington state jail recently rejected a fundraising letter featuring censored illustrations from the book because they are obscene or sexually explicit material as defined by policy. The content rejected by the prison was described by Planned Parenthood Vice President Michael McGee as delightful while calling the book itself a boon for kids, their parents, and their teachers. The question is, if these images are too obscene for adult prisoners, why are they good for 10-year-old children? It's Perfectly Normal by Roby Harris has entire chapters devoted to sexual intercourse, contraception, masturbation, homosexuality, and abortion. Page 15 of the book explains that sexual intercourse, or having sex, can involve the penis and the vagina, or the mouth and the genitals, or the penis and the anus. Nowhere does the book describe the virtue of chastity, and in fact on page 48, Harris attacks the religious belief that masturbation is morally wrong by saying, some religions claim that masturbation is a sin, but masturbation cannot hurt you. She then provides illustrations of a young boy and a young girl masturbating with an accompanying how-to explanation. Free copies of the book are distributed to children in grades 7 through 9 at their annual sex party in Waco, Texas. In several states, the contents of its perfectly normal fall directly under the definition of pornography, and in some cases, child pornography. As Joanne Carcos of Lewiston, Maine recently said, after refusing to return the book to a public library, hopefully this will harness enough people to be sufficiently horrified and want to speak out. 
to say that it's gone too far indeed. So here's an example of just how bizarre this will become. This is a list of gender preferences that was given to teenagers in Brighton School in the UK. Now it's not part of Common Core, but as we all know, the UK is like the US in sexualizing and perverting their youth. Let's read through these categories. I thought this was a rather interesting list that I thought I'd share with you. Now, there's 23 genders here they can pick from. And let's go down it and see if you can think of which of these would apply to you. Okay, there's boy and there's girl. And there's tomboy, female, male, young woman, young man, trans girl. Uh, then there's trans boy, and then there's gender fluid, uh, agender, androgynous, bigender, non-binary, or you could be a demi-boy or a demi-girl. You could be gender queer, gender non-conforming, trigender, all genders, in the middle of boy and girl, intersex, <laughs> not sure, rather not say, and if you couldn't pick out one that was in there, we, you can go, you know, other, please describe. I think this is how crazy it's getting. It's really getting out here. Back to the U.S. Here's something that was covered by RT, redone by a fellow podcaster, Press Reset Earth. And by, by the way, he has a great channel. Check this out. In Chicago, um, Magnet Elementary School, Parents are horrified when they saw the obscene sexual education materials their fifth graders would be learning. The curriculum included condom de demonstrations and discussions of anal sex. And you can see here, <laughs> look at this, okay? Feel good reasons to use female condoms, FCs, right? Once you pop, you won't have to stop. Ha <laughs> ha! These 10-year-olds, 9, 10, 11-year-olds are learning about how to use female condoms, anal insertion, easy as one, two, three. Yeah, we gotta sim simplify it for, for them because their brains aren't developed. Of course, we gotta simplify it, right? Insert the inner ring into the anal opening and use your finger to guide it inside. So yeah, finger your own butthole. Yeah, let's do that, let's do that. And they're, oh, what's this? This, okay, this is, I didn't catch this when I first read the article. 100% proof they're ch this, this is gay sex they're teaching them this is a a male anatomy and they're showing you how to insert the female condom into the male anus okay this is gay sex they're teaching this is gay sex they're teaching that is gay sex why else would you put a female condom into a male anus because you want to insert something into a male anus that's why and the Wow, wow, this is straight from the curriculum. So this is what can happen when society adopts moral relativity or situational ethics. Moral relativity and situational ethics are the second tenet of Satanism, by the way. This is why Aleister Crowley said, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. It's a total moralless society. Do what thou wilt. And it, you don't have to think very deeply to realize a society cannot survive on this credo. There is morality. Certain things are bad and certain things are okay or good. Having sex with a young child is bad. Think of the consequences to society, let alone that young child. Killing millions in an illegal war is bad. Now it's gotten so people outside the U.S. no longer see the U.S. as, a, well, it's been a long time, as a beacon of democracy and human rights. They see the U.S. as a rogue nation wiping out infrastructure and killing millions. There's right and wrong. There's good and bad. You can't go on to moral relativity and have a society that lasts more than one generation. Teaching moral relativity is dooming your society. We better wake up and try to do something. Well, what we showed you is what's happening now, not what's going to happen. Who knows with a program like this where your society, let alone your children, could end up. So I've got some advice. One, 
do some research. Find out what's going on in your public school. And just between you and I, the second piece of advice would be to get your kids out of there. So I hope this has been enlightening and interesting. Thank you very much. Take care.